So welcome to the United Nations. I'd like to represent, uh, to introduce the delegate from Kazakhstan. No, seriously, this is a, a very strange room. But it's a pleasure to be here, despite uh, the blizzard conditions. Uh, for, as for myself traveling, I was uh, stranded in London for 12 hours on Sunday. Got to know the airport lounge quite well. But anyway, are you ready to boldly go where no one has gone before? I hope you're all sci-fi fans. I don't mean to promote any particular brand here. But we're entering a period of a tremendous rate of change in the game industry. And I'm going to get into that. But first, just to set the stage, I'll tell you a little bit about digital chocolate. We make games like Millionaire City, which came out on Facebook. It's been on the iPhone. And uh, we're now uh, also operating it as an open browser game. Uh, we're now starting to also do more hardcore browser games. And in fact, today, we're launching our first uh, such game that was developed by a third party developer. It's a game called Reborn Empire, and it's uh, now available at games.digitalchocolate.com, which is where we're kind of building up a bit of an open uh, browser game business. And we know platforms. Uh, we're, I think, the, still the only company in the world that has had over 100 million uh, Apple App Store downloads and 100 million Facebook game sessions and 100 million open browser. Uh, game sessions. So we've done a lot of volume on a lot of platforms. We've actually done a lot of things wrong. We've made all kinds of mistakes. So we kind of know what doesn't work in addition to figuring out what uh, does. And uh, we know how to make good games. We've made over 100 that are award-winning games. And we have kind of a global presence, uh, even though we're headquartered in Silicon Valley. Actually, most of our employees are here in Europe. And this is where most of our studio uh, production is. So when we look at the industry going forward, it's not all decided. You know, Zynga, of course, has a very dominant position on Facebook. There are other companies dominating other spaces like Warcraft. But here are five categories of games that, to a large extent, are still brand new, wide open, and where there's a lot of opportunity for, for new companies. And of course, browser games have been around for a while, but even the browser as a platform is just getting warmed up. Because at the moment, it's really only strong in the PC. And I fully expect the browser to spread to tablets, to continue to make inroads on smartphones, and to show up on TVs. And beyond just what platform a game is on, you know, we have a history in the game industry of everyone making native games for one platform, and there being one dominant platform that generates most of the revenue in a particular period of time. We're now finally getting to a point where this is social media. And with every social medium in history, they started out as silos. And this is even true about roads for cars. They were all privately owned in the beginning. And you didn't have the right to just drive anywhere you wanted. You had to pay money to get access to different roads. And in every case of a social medium, whether it's uh, the phones in the first place, or mobile voice, or instant messaging, or email, or texting, uh, picture, uh, uh, picture messages, MMS, in every one of those cases, they started as silos. And of course, uh, people didn't use them very much because they didn't know who they could reach and who they could not reach. And as soon as they became interoperable, in every case, that platform got 100 times bigger. In fact, texting, humble texting, is an industry today that's over $100 billion in global revenue. So interoperability has not been important in the game industry but that's just yet another thing that's on the horizon that's going to become important as gamers change their habits about how they want to play. So there's a lot of leadership opportunities available. What I see happening now is the era of convenience. Uh, this is what the dictionary would tell you about convenience. Suited to a person's needs, comfort or purpose within easy reach, handy. Increasingly, consumers are trading to give up performance to get convenience. And they do this in just about everything. And we've already seen this transformation in every media type except games. In the old days, if you wanted to hear music, you had to actually go hear live music. And <clears throat> now, of course, you're more likely to be listening to it through an earbud while you're jogging or on an airplane. So the quality of the music has gone down, but the convenience of the music is spectacular. Same thing with uh, film. You can see a really fabulous, high-performance, 70-millimeter 3D movie in a movie theater. But you never go to a movie theater. It's too inconvenient. 
because not only do you have to find a three hour block of time, you have to negotiate schedules with whoever you want to go with. So people don't do it. In fact, uh, theatrical release revenue, it's been, if you adjust for inflation, it's been flat for the last 60 years. But how about video viewing? That's gone through the roof. And we're watching all of, all of this video in the comfort of our homes, on our laptop devices while we're traveling, at work. How often do you just click on a YouTube link and watch a video? So again, there's an example where it's not about the high performance, it's about the convenience. So this is happening everywhere. And it's consistent with the concept of disruptive product theory. Uh, if you don't know this theory, it was developed by a Harvard professor named Clayton Christensen. He wrote a very famous book. It's called The Innovator's Dilemma. And he framed the fact that in many industries in the last 100 years, you have a traditional industry serving a traditional customer base and a upstart new company comes along and they offer a lower performance product that has fewer features, it's not as powerful, but it offers some new thing, some new feature that creates some new benefit and it attracts a new audience. And eventually, it tilts that market. And, and then later on in his research, it's not as well known, but he continued to research dozens of different industries and he found something else that was always true about disruption, which is this trade in which even the traditional customer, who was a high performance customer, gives up performance to get convenience. So we've now seen it in all of these categories. And you might wonder, well, why is it that in games it hasn't fully happened at the same rate that it's happened with other media? Very simple. Games are the most complex media type, the most complex data type. So that's, that's why uh, they're, they're coming along last. When, you, when, you, when games require such high performance, you have to buy a dedicated device like a console, or you need to have a high performance PC and do a big download, it's gonna be harder to convert that into a, a really convenient form. But it's, but it's already going on. That's why we have a casual game association, uh, because the casual games are a really big part of this trend. So what, so what does this look like? The gamers are growing up. You know, obviously I'm one of the uh, older gamers, shall we say, and when I was a kid, you know, you played with your friends in the neighborhood, and then when I was in college, you played with your friends in the dormitory room, and then you get out of school, and you're a lot busier. You have a job. Uh, you also start to have uh, boyfriends and girlfriends and spouses, and then you have children, and you're just getting busier and busier and busier. So if you're a core gamer, how many of you in your heart feel like you are a core gamer? Okay. What's happened to us as core gamers is that you just don't have the luxury to go down to your basement and spend 50 hours in a PlayStation game. You don't have the luxury to max out a level 65 character in Lotro or Warcraft. And you don't have time to master all the dexterity hand-eye coordination demands of an action game but you still have a heart to beat the crap out of other gamers. You still like to win. You still like to feel really smart and capable. But it needs to come in a more convenient package. So we all have smartphones. We all have social network memberships to things like Facebook. We're all at the office where we're looking at all our social channels. We got the browser open. It's really easy to try things in the browser. It's really easy to spread them virally. And we find, for example, with our Facebook customers that most of the game playing and the money being spent is during business hours. So the, this uh, gamer, as they age, they're trying to fit it in to their lifestyle, which is increasingly busy. But fortunately, they start to have money available to spend on it. So that's why they're looking for short sessions. They're trying to fit them in 24 by 7. They want to come in from different access points on different networks, on different screen sizes. Uh, someone I know in the industry said that the wolves go where the sheep are. That's not a bad analogy, but I'm going to give you a better one later. But if you think about it, again, if I'm a core gamer, I want to win. I want to beat somebody. And in the old days, of course, I'd have to invest hours and hours and do the grinding and develop the mastery to be sure I could win. And of course, as you get older, you're willing to substitute money for time. And that's, that's why we're uh, seeing the birth of 
free-to-play games with virtual goods economies. But the games need to be casual. Why? Because that way you get all the sheep, all, all of the people that have social motivation, that just want the social connectivity and they want a game they can handle. But then the wolves come in and spend the money and become the big winners, the dominant uh, players. And it's worth it. You know, even, even if uh, one of these wolves or whales, it's the other word from the, the, the uh, gambling industry that's used, if a whale can spend $1,000 or even $5,000, if they get to feel like they're king of that world, that's worth it. Look at the other stuff that people spend money on. They'll spend money on luxury, automobiles, fashion, gifts, entertainment, uh, furnishings, artwork. They'll spend all kinds of money on stuff that is supposed to increase their social status, their social desirability, and they may still feel like a loser. But you spend $1,000 and dominate an online game, you know, you feel like a winner. And back in 1996, uh, when I was at 3DO, we introduced a game called Meridian 59. Any of you remember, remember this game? Okay, a lot of people think of this as the first graphical MUD or the first graphical MMO. And it was a totally hardcore hack and slash RPG and mind-boggling things happened. The avatars would arrange to get married to each other. And there's no reward for this. You were more likely to get assaulted by a rival guild and they'd kill everyone. But you'd find the nicest room in the dungeon, you'd invite all the other avatars, you'd pick the most prestigious avatar to be the master of ceremonies, you'd get your avatars hitched, maybe you'd split up later. But then what happened, is that some of these people behind the avatars, they would get married in real life and have children. Does that blow your mind? And that's in a hardcore game. So think about the social value here. If people are looking for love in a game like that and finding it, there's something very powerful going on. So it's not a really a big shock that when instant messaging comes along, when Facebook comes along, when social games come along, that you make it more casual, you make it possible for everybody to do it, then the social value is going to be that much greater. And there's a lot of people that are just doing it for the social value to be connected with other people. And maybe they're looking to meet somebody, who knows? And everybody's got different social needs. But the core gamer is there to win. And that's why I use this concept of casual mastery, because you know, it's consistent with this uh, traditional statement I've always made, which is that great games need to be simple, hot, and deep. Keep it simple. That way everybody can figure it out. Everybody can be attracted to it. Make it hot. You know, make it compelling. Make it inviting. Uh, do things that lure people in and excite them and get the dopamine transmission uh, hormones going. But then provide the depth so that the core gamer, there's always more to do. There's always more to master. There's always more to get you to think. And I think ultimately that's what we want as gamers is to be thinking and, and using that to you know, manage our resources and make our tactics and our strategy decisions, etc. So I know fantasy football is not as big a deal here in Europe, but I think there are probably over 10 million Europeans, maybe 20 million Europeans doing fantasy sports on the internet. In America, it's more like 40 million. And I think of this as a precursor to an enormous market uh, that I'm talking about here. Because if you think about uh, the player that does that, a core gamer sets up a league, they invite their friends to play it. A lot of their friends join because it's very casual. It's something they can handle. When they're at work, they check in uh, on their new sites on their browser. Uh, when it's the weekend and some games are being played, uh, they're, they're checking in maybe from their smartphone while they're watching TV, or maybe they're watching their daughter play uh, in a soccer game and they're checking on their smartphone. And maybe in the middle of the week, there's a deadline for setting up a lineup. And now they're, you know, they wait until the uh, kids have gone to bed, and now they're having a, that lean-in experience on their PC at home. So they're roaming across different access points. They're playing an interoperable game. Uh, in effect, it's a browser-based game. And they're, you know, the, the wolves, uh, you know, playing with the sheep. And, you know, that's an example where, again, there's already 60 million people playing, playing that kind of game. Of course, we have phenomena like Facebook, but I think it's more interesting to look behind, beyond a social network like Facebook and, and look for examples of mass market behavior like this that extend into the future. And there are 150 million households that have bought a console 
that means there's got to be at least one core gamer in that household. And if you think about it, uh, Zynga, they have about 200 million uh, players on Facebook. Only 8 million have spent any money. That's kind of normal. 1 million of them have spent the vast majority of the money. If you get 1 million people to spend $1,000 a year to be a whale in a social game like Mafia Wars or Zynga Poker, that's a billion dollars a year. So that basically describes where the money comes from for Zynga. If there's 150 million of these console homes and only a million or two of those people have migrated over, just think about how much bigger this market is going to be as more of those people make that transition. So again, how many of you have ever purchased a console? Okay, now keep your hand up if you've already made this migration that I'm talking about. Are you playing simpler, convenient games in your browser, on your social network, or on your, on your phone? So that's a whole lot more people yet to come. You know, we're the early adopters, right? So that's, that's why we're all doing it already. There's another 100, 140, 150 million uh, more to come. So I like to think of this as uh, the dolphin market. So let's forget about wolves and sheep and whales. Let's go with a different animal. Why would, why would we call ourselves and these other people dolphins? Well, dolphins are curious and intelligent. That's how we feel about ourselves. And we love to play. And we like the social value. And dolphins, you know, you, you notice how dolphins, uh, if a boat goes out, the dolphins will come over to the boat. You know, they want to check it out. They, they like hanging around with human beings. They hang around with the fish. They hang around with the whales. They're very social. They're also very competitive. You know, like right now around San Francisco, there are dolphins killing rival porpoise in territory battles. So I know you thought dolphins are really cute and really charming, but they're just as carnivorous and just as nasty as killer whales. They're just a smaller and more streamlined whale. And of course, they also have been on the wireless internet for thousands of years. They call it echolocation. But that's a method of communication they've had for a while. And they prefer casual, short sessions. So basically, <clears throat> anybody that's a, that was a console gamer that has chosen to play in this more convenient form, that's a dolphin. And they need to play with other fish. And that's what they're doing. So in honor of uh, those of you that are German, I'm just going to say, for our market going forward, the Gestalt is dolphin. And of course, it's going to all these screens. So how do you deal with that? And what form will it take? So again, our belief is that it's the free-to-play model, social with virtual goods. And I don't mean social meaning it has to be in a social network. I just mean that you want to be playing with other people. They can be strangers. They can be friends. They can be gamer friends, et cetera. And virtual goods is the right way to monetize. Because if you think about what was wrong with packaged goods, and this includes casual game downloads. Basically, you're trying to get a fixed fee to be paid for the game, and the public doesn't want to do it. If you have a free game, then you're going to get an enormous audience. And with virtual goods, you can create an unlimited economy where the serious players will spend a lot more than $50 or $60. And meanwhile, gamers that only wanted to spend $10, they can spend $10. If they only want to fill out an offer, and, and maybe generate $2 in revenue, they can do that too. So this model is the best way to maximize the economic income. And then you want to make it more like a trip to Vegas. Uh, another industry colleague once said to me, we don't want to be like Facebook. They're like a church social. We want to be a trip to Vegas. And if you think about a trip to Vegas, anybody here made a trip to Vegas or another casino? OK, so you know what this is like. You go with a group. And there are the really casual people there that aren't spending a lot of money gambling, but they're enjoying the entertainment, the social value, the drinks, the food, the shows, et cetera. And maybe they'll put a few coins in the slot machines. And then somebody in the group really is serious about gambling. And they're up all night at the poker tables or playing Baccarat, et cetera. And they might lose $10,000 or make $5,000, you know, et cetera. So, uh, but, but, the, it, but it's an inclusive form of entertainment. Everybody can participate, and they're just involved in it in different ways. So that's, the, that's really the style in which this game is going to take place. And then the browser becomes the centerpiece, because the browser has now become the fundamental way that people organize the way they use computers. Every kid over the age of five is in a school learning how to use a browser on a PC. That's the one fundamental thing they're going to know about a computer. 
And nowadays, particularly, you look at a lot of the revolutionary behavior going on in second world countries and Arabia, et cetera, there are people that basically are going into the browser to find out what's going on in their world, and even in their own town. You know what? When I want information about one of my employees, I use Google search. <laughs> It's just the fastest way to find out what's going on. So it's really sort of the new town square where you, have, you go to find out what's going on. And then the customers are increasingly going to ask questions like, can I get to the cloud from here? Can I pick up where I left off? And can I communicate with everyone? And that's really the key in the future about this idea of interoperability is that when you send a text to someone and they don't reply, in the old days it was like, hmm, maybe their network is not interoperable with mine. You're not really sure what happened and then you stop doing it after a while. But when people start contacting you through a medium and you start contacting them and getting replies all the time, you realize, oh, everybody's doing this. And then you do it more. And then it takes on the quality of being fashionable and trendy and then people want to do it even more. So th that's going to really help uh, drive a lot more adoption. And then from a platform perspective, it starts on the PC, but then it goes everywhere. And let's just start with the fact that there are two billion PCs. A lot of them are in internet cafes, they're in shops, they're in airport lounges. A lot of them are shared. A lot of them are in offices being shared as well. So there's probably already three billion people using these PCs every day. And every day they have their social channels right there, their email, their instant messaging, their Twitter, their, their uh, other channels, their social networks, and the browser's right there next to it. And frankly, that makes it much easier to drive virality and free trial completion. Uh, through uh, the browser. That gives the browser a tremendous advantage. Okay, if you look at the, uh, say, Wall Street investor side in terms of how they view the market, uh, they would basically point out that the global market in games last year was about 50 billion. But what's interesting in that figure is that 35 billion of it was traditional console and PC games, and the remaining 15 was social and mobile. Now, if you go back five years to 2007, just the traditional console PC part was 50. So it's, it's gone from 50 to 35, and then it's forecasted to go down to 15 in five years, according to this forecast. So from 50 to 15, that's a big drop. You may have noticed in the last 10 years that Sony has lost over $100 billion in market cap. You may have noticed that Zynga now has a higher enterprise value than Nintendo or EA. This is happening, and investors are paying attention to the fact that it's happening. So for all of us, think about it. If, if it's still, according to this forecast, if it was only 15 billion last year, and it's gonna be 100 billion in five years, and this is the first idiot other than me to say this. So I, I, I said this well over a year ago. I said, yeah, this, is, this category is going to be 100 billion. And I think people thought I was, well, they always think I'm crazy, so that's not new. But now there's a, a respected Wall Street analyst saying it. So I'm, I'm going to just refer to him from now on. Okay, what does it require from a technology standpoint if you want to take advantage of this? You have to learn a new set of best practices. It's very different whether you're talking about the old casual game downloadable business or you're talking about MMOs or you're talking about traditional games, this is very different. And you have to be thinking cross-platform, uh, moving towards being interoperable, of course having a browser cloud uh, bias. And you have to learn about not just how to use social network social features, but in any game, how to make that game more social, how to make that game have its own social plumbing features intrinsic to the game, how to have it have game mechanics and game design that encourage uh, social behavior. You better pay attention to HTML5. And of course, native apps are going to remain important for a while, but again, in my view, it's much more difficult to discover and install and use native apps, and you only get to use them in the place where you installed them. So they don't really qualify the way I think that a truly convenient browser game can qualify. And I think in the long run, the browser is going to keep getting better. It's going to keep getting more ubiquitous on every platform. And in the long run, I think the browser is the big winner. But apps, native apps are going to remain important for a while. And in particular, they'll remain viable and important in the high performance category. So anybody that's doing, say, 3D uh, immersive games will you know, continue to prefer doing native development. But for a lot of other people, that's just not going to be a requirement. Meanwhile, the business models 
are going to be just completely disrupted in ways that a lot of people don't understand yet. When I built Electronic Arts, I was using distribution business model principles. Electronic Arts was the first game company that sold games directly to retailers. I eliminated the distributors as a middleman, went straight to market. I did that partly because having been at Apple before that and building distribution there, we had done the same thing and it had been really essential to Apple's business. So in a distribution business model, you're building up a pipeline and you're trying to get control over the pipeline, control over shelf space, and what matters in distribution is things like scale, financial leverage, and brand power. Again, you can, if you think about electronic arts, you think of things like that. That was a very essential part of the founding principles I had for the company. But now we have a situation where a new business model is going to emerge, and I call it discovery. It's not like distribution, because there's really no shelf space. There's no channels. Nobody has a chokehold over it. And the reason for that is that, in fact, in a lot of media industries, they talk about the master switch. You know, who, who turns on the TV channel and controls what's on the air? Who controls what's on the radio? Who controls what's out there? If you're in a distribution model, somebody controls a master switch. Well, who controls the master switch for the World Wide Web? Al Gore. Al Gore? He, he only wish, he wishes. <laughs> I'll tell you who controls it. The public controls it. Now, indirectly, the public uses Google Search as their proxy because they believe that Google can be held honest to provide legitimate search results. The very day that Google ruins that brand value and, and loses their integrity, then people will switch to a different search engine. But what drives the master switch of the World Wide Web is search and discovery of links that you can click on that are not controlled by one channel. So, so let's look for some examples of how this has worked. YouTube, two guys literally in a garage in Palo Alto just created their own site, started getting uh, even mediocre stuff on it. But what did they do? They made it convenient up until YouTube if you wanted to look at video, you had to download and install a video player. And then they had apps. So that's a, a very poignant example of this, uh, this principle of convenience and being in the browser. They had to dumb down the quality, something that the previous video providers didn't want to do. So they had to go with basically pretty mediocre flash uh, video quality. But it was so convenient and it spread so virally through the browser. The newspaper industry recently pulled the plug on Apple because Apple started saying, hey, you know, uh, if you get subscribers through some other marketing channel, uh, yeah, we want 30% of that too. And the newspaper said, uh, I don't think so. So now they're running an HTML5 outside uh, the App Store. But, uh, maybe the leading example of this is uh, FT, the Financial Times uh, in, uh, in England. Another example, when J.K. Rowling wrote Harry Potter, she needed a book publisher, and she needed retailers. So she got a very small slice of the book value chain. But she was able to build a brand, and now she's ready for the ebook business. So what's she doing? Pottermore.com. A lot of people are looking for stuff related to Harry Potter using search. There's Pottermore. Click on it. Boom. You're in the cloud. You can, you can uh, read the books that way. She doesn't need any help from anybody. Now you can say, oh, that's only because she's got this powerful brand. But the reality is that YouTube didn't start with a powerful brand. I mean, you can do this whether you have a brand or not. Because what matters is not the brand. What matters is that it's free to try it. And the public is going to decide if it's relevant. They're going to decide if it's any good. And if it's good, it will build its own brand power. And if you stick a brand on it and it's not good, you're going to destroy brand power. There's a huge opportunity here for the creation of new brands, Zynga being a very good recent example. The other thing, of course, is that <clears throat> there's no gatekeepers. Anybody can get a URL and put something out there. And it's free, it's open, it's fair, it's democratic, it's competitive. Is there another platform for games where any of those things are true? Any of them? 
No. So many developers today are really frustrated. They, they were promised this honeymoon period on uh, Apple or on another closed platform, and they found out that it's not like the World Wide Web. It's not really open, free, and democratic. And the rules are constantly changing because the king of that, of that particular platform decides to change the rules. It's very difficult to have a stable business uh, if you're a developer in that situation. Of course, we've also now figured out with these uh, internet games, and this is true about the internet in general, you have to have a favorable lift to drag ratio between the cost of acquiring traffic and how you monetize that traffic. But if you have a free game that's in the open browser, you're going to get traffic to it. And if that game has a good virtual goods economy, it's going to monetize. And as soon as you realize you have a favorable ratio, you can use advertising to buy more traffic and generate more revenue and more profit. If you don't have the monetization side figured out, then you're not going to go anywhere. But there are obviously uh, numerous examples where you can get that monetization cycle to work. So this is a great opportunity for indie developers to make original uh, game content and to have a, a shot at being the next Zynga, just on the basis of uh, how, how good a developer that you are. So this is a really radical change. There are a lot of companies that depend very heavily on what they've learned from the past. Because you know what? Human beings have been doing distribution models for thousands of years. It's probably in our genetic code. You know, it's a fundamental thing about agrarian economies and industrial economies. It's been part of our lives uh, since we were born. This idea of discovery, this is a radical change. So it's basically upsetting hundreds of thousands of years of uh, human understanding of how you do business. So a lot of traditional stakeholders, that's why they're being disrupted so badly. And that's why a, 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 an upstart new company like Zynga can become so big so quickly. So just to really drive this point home, when I built Electronic Arts, I used these 10 fundamental principles of distribution business models. And I'll tell you that all 10 of these principles are obsolete in a discovery model. Electronic Arts cannot use them. I cannot use them. You cannot use them. Amazon cannot use them. It's a, it's a whole new deal with a discovery model. So when you have disruption, of course, you're going to have a lot of opportunity. And of course, that means opportunity to learn and practice and get better at these new business models, to basically compete with and take uh, market share and customers away from the uh, declining console market. And if you look at uh, uh, what has happened in Japan, a really big value shift there is Sony declined in value, and Nintendo declined in value. And what happened is that the phone companies did the innovation. So NTT Docomo launched the first data phone. They invented the app store. They invented the mobile web. They invented mobile email. Pretty soon in Japan, there was more mobile email than PC email. They invented microtransactions. And they were very generous in realizing that they should give away most of the content value chain. So they said to developers, I'll put a link here, and people can click on that link, and then they're going to go to you, and you're going to have to host your own content. And I will then do integrated billing, settlement, and payment by charging the customer on their monthly phone bill. Pretty good deal. Because you know what? Acquiring payment from a user is very difficult. If uh, Docomo just has it one touch payment, like it now works on the iPhone, that's a pretty good arrangement. And they only charged 8% of the content fees. So the other Japanese carriers copied that, KDDI, for example. And then SKT copied it in Korea. So it's not a big surprise that in Japan and Korea, like where in the world do we have the, the greatest degree of 3G and 4G wireless networks? Where do we have the greatest degree of, of uh, mobile game uh, adoption? Where do we have the highest amount of data spending on mobile networks? Where do we have the greatest degree of money being spent on microtransactions? And then if you look at uh, Japan, you, you created this middle layer of companies, GRI, Mixi, DNA, that operates uh, mobagay.com. And those guys created kind of a middle layer, and then content could go on top of that. So there, it was a, it's a very healthy ecosystem for everybody. Unfortunately, nobody else anywhere in the world did it that way. The mobile operators were, unfortunately, interested in keeping about half of the value chain, 
What happened in Japan is they made up the money on the data plans. But the, uh, the rest of the world said, well, yeah, we're going to make the money on the data plans. That's all ours. But then we're also going to take half of, of uh, uh, the game revenue. And as a result, uh, it just wasn't healthy enough for it to really move forward. And of course, the phone companies weren't very great at technology. So it took a company like Apple, it took a company like Facebook to stir things up and to provoke the more recent changes we've seen in the West. Uh, by the way, if you look at China, <clears throat> you know, you'd like to think of China as being really advanced. I mean, it's certainly the biggest world market for MMOs and virtual goods for that reason. But they, they're, they banned Facebook. Uh, Google doesn't operate there. Uh, uh, China Mobile is just as backward as any carrier in the world. So they have not been disrupted by smartphones, they have not been disrupted by social networks, and they have not been disrupted by the browser. But they will be. I was talking to a friend of mine who licenses a 3D MMO engine to many of the uh, uh, Chinese uh, companies, and he says that they don't have enough broadband capacity to deliver the uh, large client downloads anymore, and they have to send out guys on bicycles with a backpack full of DVDs and take them around to all the uh, shops. And so you don't download them anymore. You have to go down to the shop to pick up a disc. How ridiculous is that? But uh, in, in spite of the obviousness that that's not really workable, uh, if, if you talk to a Chinese uh, developer, they're going to say, oh, yeah, our customers are trained to do these big downloads. That's going to be great. They don't see the disruption that's going to come from the convenience of the browser. And then, of course, you, know, you have uh, different companies that are, in fact, uh, you know, they, they've either had their glory period or they're having it now. But uh, there are just many different categories where they're going to get uh, disrupted by these changes. All right, so what do you, wanna, what do you need to do if you want to be a leader in this next phase? Well, you have to have systematic advantages. A game developer cannot simply assume that they will make the best game or the only good ones. A lot of us can make a superior game. So you can't just say, that's my strategy. I'm going to make the best game. You know, you, you see Angry Birds and you think, oh, I could do that. Or you see Farmville and you say, man, that's not even a game. I can do better than that. Well, did you know that Angry Birds was Rovio's 43rd game? And you know what? The industry as a whole does not succeed one time out of 43. It's more like one time out of 500 in terms of getting something that's that big. You know, those of you that have been doing this for a while, you know what I mean. It's hard to be the guy with that really super hot game because it just doesn't happen very often. That's not a predictable way to plan to make a living. You need to look for a more systematic advantage. So where's that going to come from? It can come from one or more of these categories. What intellectual property value can you create and own? Of course, that's what Rovio now says about Angry Birds. They say, oh, yeah, we didn't just make a game. We made a brand. And they succeeded in that. And that's, that's better thinking. It's like when George Lucas made Star Wars. He hung on to the merchandising rights, and the film industry let him because they had never been able to get any value out of merchandising rights. And they go, OK, yeah, we like this movie, so sure, you can keep that. <laughs> George knew exactly what he was up to. Uh, same thing with um, uh, a culture of innovation. You can build an organization that has more confidence and more ability to make innovative, original games. Because you know what? Most of the industry is not willing to do that. They're too afraid. So what do they do? They license brands. They clone other people's games. That's not going to get you as far. So, you know, but it takes effort if you want to build a culture of innovation. You can also look for technology leverage. A lot of little guys have a hard time investing in technology because they're just trying to hustle and make one game. And if that one game is successful on a software as a service model, then they have to support and maintain that game. And then it's harder to get to a second game. But you know, any, any company that, that has the scale where you can invest in technology and then have code libraries and frameworks and components that you can pull off a shelf when you start a new game and already be half finished, or to have translation tools that help you reach your foreign languages and different screen sizes and different platforms more gracefully off of one uh, product development thrust, big advantage if you can do that. And that you know, sort of relates to this idea of R&D efficiency if we don't make sure that we're efficient, uh, we're all going to lose to the guy that has the lowest cost labor who's likely to be in a place like China. So it's imperative if you're in a labor market that's more expensive than China that you figure out 
how to save costs through technology leverage and other forms of R&D efficiency. And then, of course, you have to be looking for efficiencies in how you acquire traffic. If you're paying for too much of your traffic, then your cost of acquisition is high, and then, wow, you're only going to be successful on those few games that monetize particularly well, and the games that are, that are in a middle range will lose money. Whereas if you figure out a way to bring that cost of acquisition down by adding more free traffic, suddenly all these games in the middle of the bell curve, suddenly they're profitable. So it's really important for the industry to bring down the effective CPA with more sources of free traffic. And of course, you know, once upon a time, uh, Zynga back in 2009, they got $300 million worth of free marketing from Facebook that year. That's how you make a company like Zynga. Well, none of us is likely to get that. <laughs> Those days are over. But we, we have to look for other ways to get more traffic efficiency. And then finally, you have to master the kind of best practices that this particular type of product uh, requires. And you have to be able to do that at scale in, in more than one game and with some degree of predictability. So what are we doing at Digital Chalk? We're going cross-platform. And I, I like this image. This is uh, America's first president, George Washington. Uh, America was losing the Revolutionary War. And in the dead of winter, this is kind of like the Hamburg Harbor right now. So under these kinds of weather conditions, Washington had his army cross the Delaware River upstream from Trenton, uh, New Jersey, and then made the surprise attack on the British Army. The British Army is thinking at the time, there's no way anybody's going to attack us right now. This is ridiculous. Nobody would be crazy enough to do that. So they crossed. And that's how I think about going cross-platform, uh, is that it takes that kind of courage, but it, not, it needs to be done. And of course, if you are cross-platform, then whatever platforms have growth, you're going to be there. And I think we all know that in the next four years, the install base of tablets is going to be one billion tablets or more. And lots and lots more people will be bringing the browser uh, to the tablets. And of course, uh, lots more people will have smartphones and social networks like Facebook will continue to grow. So if you're cross-platform, you benefit from all of these revenue categories. We just launched a game called uh, Galaxy Life. And this is the first product we, we launched where we have a Facebook version that runs inside Facebook. But then we also have a, a version that runs at our open browser game portal, which is at games.digitalchocolate.com. And you can play it on our portal. And you can be logged into Facebook if you like or you don't have to be a Facebook member. So it's, it's really truly an open browser game where uh, Facebook is, a, is an alternative. And we've started to bring uh, some of these games to the mobile side also. And this is the, this is the front page of uh, our game portal. When, when it matures a little bit further, we'll have it revert to our main landing page at digitalchocolate.com. And basically, the notion for, for us of this portal is that we can now host both games that we create as well as third-party games like uh, Reborn Empire that I mentioned earlier. Uh, we're going to use a lot of cross-promotion uh, features that we've uh, mastered in the Facebook environment. And we think of this as uh, a place for competitive games, not the more peaceful uh, kinds of games that uh, you know, we're, we're not as interested in the lower-value customers that want to do peaceful things uh, and we, we want the guys that are more competitive that are trying to up the ante with each other. Again, uh, you don't have to uh, say in Facebook, you know, everybody knows who you are and your social graph knows what games you're playing and it's, you know, obviously uh, a little bit of a violation of privacy. But if you're just playing on a game portal like ours, you, can, you don't have to reveal who you are. You can play anonymously. You can, you know, have the whole uh, uh, screen take, taken over by the game. And, and then you can do a lot of things that we know work because we used to do them on Facebook, but then Facebook banned them. You know, things like uh, incentives and certain viral features that would enhance uh, uh, both uh, new traffic as well as return rates. And I think it's important to recognize that for all of us in the game business, the game is more important than the, the idea of a more generic social network. And I might even go so far as to say that we are pro-games it's not really clear Facebook's stance about games, because I, I think they do some things that are, that are better and some things that are not. Whereas I think uh, when you think about peaceful social behavior, that's what uh, Facebook wants to be all about. In that sense, I, can th I think of ourselves as, frankly, a little bit antisocial. <laughs> you know, it's like, hey, let's go beat the heck out of each other, and let's, be, let's compete, and let's spend money, and really get back to that satisfaction of core gaming. So I think the way we're approaching this is very unique. It's not quite like what everybody else uh, is doing, and we're excited about it. 
Now we have another dimension that I'm going to mention today uh, for any of you that uh, might be interested in it. And if this idea intrigues you, uh, feel free to email me. I forgot to put my email address in a slide, but it's just thawkins at digitalchocolate.com. You know, feel free to email me if you have interest in this notion. So if you think about uh, free traffic and you think about developer choices about platforms, you know, developers, they, they need a place where they can control their own fate. And the one and only place where they can do that is the open browser. And they also need more sources of traffic. And it turns out there are a lot of companies that are not gigantic digital platform winners. And I'm talking about maybe companies that are still in console games or they're in retailing or they run web websites that run, uh, that run uh, game reviews for console games. A lot of these guys have valuable customer relations with those 150 million console households, but they're losing value because a lot of those people have uh, switched over and are spending more time in social networks and on their mobile devices, et cetera. So what we want to do is basically address an issue that developers have in terms of getting free traffic and that there are some strategic partners out there that may want to help us with because it helps give them a, a way of, of uh, organizing developers outside of some of these captive platforms. So that's the idea of freegameleaders.com. Uh, by the way, if you look for this on the uh, internet, you won't be able to get into it. It's not, uh, just, it's not exposed to the public yet. But the idea here is you get a bunch of indie developers who do not individually have any market power who do not individually have a cross-promotional network within their own games, who don't have the kind of marketing budget or scale, who can't really run and operate their own platform, but collectively, they have a lot of power. And you have a site, freegameleaders.com, which is truly free, nonprofit, that doesn't have any corporate agenda or any profit motive that's not dominated by any one partner company. And it's just a collective that's operating for the benefit of its members. And these are you know, members that are looking for new sources of free traffic and that want to build a, another place that developers can, that can call home. But it's not trying to be a social network. It's not trying to be a destination. It's not trying to host games or you know, deliver inventory from shelves. You know, it's not trying to offer payment methods, none of that. It's just a traffic interchange, kind of like a Yellow Pages. And it's focused entirely on open browser games that don't require plugins, installs, downloads, platform memberships, the kind of games that support this argument I'm making for convenience. That, okay, here it is, try it, boom, you're in, you're playing. And these would be games that uh, need, to, need to be in Western Europe or in North America so that there's quality of traffic uh, that they're sharing that has, uh, that has more value. And I, I like to compare this idea to Steam. You know, those of you that know steampower.com, it was started by Valve. When they started that, the traditional game industry thought it was really stupid. Well, it now does something like $4 billion a year in revenue. And any PC gamer that ever went to Steam looked at it and said, yeah, I like this place. These guys are talking about the games I care about, and they have all of them. This is a good place for me to come back to. And then, of course, they started downloading uh, PC games. So there really is no such clearly positioned place today that does this in an organized fashion uh, for uh, multiple companies, the way Steam does it. And I think there's a, a good opportunity for free game leaders to become that if enough indie developers decide to uh, participate. And it doesn't cost much of anything to participate. This is just a traffic exchange. There's, there's not meaningful uh, financial obligations to be part of it. OK, so <clears throat> the concept is basically there would be three kinds of partners in it. Traffic partners that have a strategic reason why they want to bring traffic to it and help the thing get established, who would be owed a traffic credit now or in the future for any traffic they contribute. So these are companies, again, that today they may have valuable emails or traffic from these valuable gamers but they don't have the business products and services to monetize, and they're losing that business to uh, these more disruptive competitors. So they might as well take some of their unsold ad inventory and drive traffic uh, to a place like Free Game Leaders and build it up as an alternative to what their competitors are doing. 
So you have traffic partners. Then you have a couple of editorial partners, so there's a little bit of uh, game review information on the site. And of course, those companies can have a very symbiotic relationship because they can bring some traffic in, but anybody that wants more information about a game can link back to their sites, so they'll get, they'll get traffic back. And then you have the games, and the games have to be qualifying games, but they'll just get free traffic. And they'll either get the free traffic because traffic comes in and clicks on them, and they'll rank according to an algorithm uh, based on their uh, relevance. And then once people are in playing that game, we'll run a little banner in there to cross promote other games in the network. And these will be games that are targeting the same customer demographic with the same type of games. And for those of you that, uh, maybe some of you have tried this in places like Facebook, and it's been corrupted on Facebook, you can tell that in some cases, well, there's not enough transparency, so you don't really understand where your clicks are coming from. We would fix that with free game leaders. And another problem is, okay, they figure out a way to, to provide really lousy traffic and try to take back valuable traffic. Or another example is, uh, you know, it, maybe it's an independent company that's doing it and that starts out as a really uh, philanthropic click trade and then go, you know, we got to take some clicks for ourselves to pay for our costs. And now we raise venture money and they told us to increase the number of clicks we're taking. And oh yeah, now we're going to sell those clicks to uh, Zynga. And you know, basically these networks then get kind of taken over by one of the big guys. So the idea with something like free game leaders is to learn from all of these things that either worked or didn't work and get it to work now in the open browser in a way that protects and preserves the long-term value for the independent developers so they can feel safe in participating. Now, some of you also may think that, well, why would I want to trade traffic with one of my competitors? Well, that's the only way it works. But there's a, there's a little bit of a mindset that, think about it, if this was a movie theater and we had all bought a movie ticket outside and we came in and we sit down, uh, if, the, if the guy that made the movie wants to have 10 minutes of opening credits, he can get away with that you're not going to leave. You know, if, if you just did a 100 gig download and install and you finally got the thing working and got your character created, yeah, you're going to come back to that game. You're not just going to abandon it. But if we're talking about open browser games right now where my friend sends me an email or it's a Facebook feed or, you know, oh, try this, bing, I click on it and I'm trying it, my commitment level is not very high. I'm in the browser, I got there very conveniently, I'm gonna leave in a few seconds. If that game has relevance, I'm gonna bookmark it, I'm gonna to remember to come back, I'm gonna tell my friends about it. If it doesn't, it doesn't matter what you did to cross-promote it, it's gonna fail. So what works perfectly in cross-promotion is that, okay, I got the guy to my game, and by the way, you wouldn't show this banner when the guy is doing the tutorial you would show it after he's safely in the game having finished the tutorial. And then if he starts to pay in that game, then you also would stop showing the banner. So we're not talking about letting anybody uh, uh, lose their paying customer. We're just talking about the free player who's about to leave that game anyway. And when he leaves, you want to get value by having them leave by clicking on one of the offers in that banner. And when they do that, you want them to go to the game that is the most similar to your game because their traffic is what you want. And when they get a customer from you, you get a customer from them. And now you have twice as many customers. And if your game is any good, you cannot help but be better off. So we've been using, doing this successfully. Again, we, all, we know all the things that don't work uh, from uh, all the volume we've done with this on, uh, on Facebook. So it's a, a very essential uh, model. And this kind of a site will very quickly get another source of free traffic. Could anybody tell me what that might be? SEO. Because a lot of gamers in the browser, they're doing game-related searches. And when they do a game-related search, what shows up organically is, in fact, not very much. And of the sites that show up, a lot of those sites are very confusing. They have things that require downloads, they have things that require plugins, things that require platform memberships, and only some of the things are really good quality uh, open browser games. So there's an issue with the identity of a lot of these sites and the customers come in and they're, they're very easily confused. They don't develop a really uh, clear brand identity for these sites. And for a lot of the new searches that, that gamers are doing, uh, you, it's just funny. Go type free browser MMO or free browser RPG into Google and see what comes up. And you're gonna see that uh, th there's not like really huge brand heavy hitters there so this site, Free Game Leaders, if enough 
industry participants collaborate on this, it will start to show up at the top of the front page of a lot of game searches for free, and it'll generate even more free traffic. Okay, so <clears throat> when you think about Europe's uh, new world here in this uh, game industry, and I'm, you know, it's, a, it's great to be here in Germany where I really feel like the competitive core browser game business got originated and, and uh, built up. You know, again, you have this issue around making sure that you have that lift to drag ratio working well. And uh, you know, I, I like to uh, uh, think about uh, analogies about, you know, about how to make this work. And one of the things that actually happened in European history is that uh, they found potatoes in South America and brought them back to Europe. And until that time, when you had a crop in a European farm field, you had to leave the field fallow every other year to let the field recover nutrients enough to be able to plant it again. So you, you, you only really got to use the, the field half the time. And when they brought potatoes back, they could grow them in the fallow field. So they doubled the efficiency of their farming. And I think that's uh, an example of where uh, our industry needs to find ways to use technology leverage. And then the next thing the Europeans found was this island off the coast of Chile that was piled with thousands of years of uh, bird poop, or guano. And they found that if you brought that guano back in ships to Europe, that you literally threw the nutrients in it, the fertilizing benefit, it tripled the productivity of your farm. So look at that. You know, and I think of that as an area of uh, discovery engineering. If, if you use these discovery principles wisely, if you support things like free game leaders, if you find ways of investing in engineering like cross-promotional technology that gets you more sources of free traffic, or social features that get you more sources of free traffic, again, there's potential to triple uh, the uh, amount of traffic that you get, and that's what happened with the guano. So just to sum up, <clears throat> we're in this era of convenience. All these uh, core gamers are coming over. It's going to happen over the next few years. The browser is going to be the centerpiece and the hottest platform. What we all need to do is disrupt ourselves in order to be part of this. Think more about that dolphin profile. Chase those dolphins. And uh, please let me know if you're interested in free game leaders. Do or do not. Thank you.